There is a bull run now. We saw incredible gains in January, and the million dollar question is, will those incredible gains continue? You know, bad news is good news for Bitcoin, but also uh, bad news is bad news for everything. It means people have less money to invest in things. For a store of value, I'm actually not looking for that value to go up necessarily. I just wanna know what the value is in a year, five years, or 10 years. What's up, guys? I'm Giovanni. Welcome to our weekly crypto market show. This time with us, Jody Pasquale, CEO at Bitbull Capital, and for the first time on our channel, Sam Bankman Fried, founder at Alameda Research. First of all, thanks a lot for being with us today. It's a pleasure to have you on our crypto market show. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks, Giovanni. Great to be here. What's your reading of the current situation in the uh, crypto market at the moment? So we, we've seen a lot of pretty jerky moves over the last few days. You know, it's sort of been a little bit reverty, but it, it hasn't been just drifting around. There's been a lot of sort of jumps up, jumps down. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't be shocked to see that continue. Um, I also, you know, wouldn't be shocked to see it break out of this range. And, and I think it could happen in either direction. I really do think that it could happen downside as well. Like, I think that there there is a sort of setup here where if there were the starts of big sell off, I, you know, I wouldn't be shocked to see it gather momentum. And so, you know, I, I think that like anything could happen, but but maybe the thing I, I feel that disagrees the most with sort of market sentiment here is that there is a significant chance of a large downward movement. Joe, do you see this chance of a downward movement? So, um, I would, definitely I do. And uh, that's, you know, I think being contrarian has helped us a lot at Bitbull in the past. Well, the last time we saw this 9500 going past this 9500 resistance was, of course, in October with the Xi Jinping news about blockchain support in China. Um, but we then went all the way back down to 60. 800 in November and testing it again in December. Um, so um, definitely, but this time we're seeing some other strong factors that, you know, um, uh, of, of supporting Bitcoin's price. So I'm actually much more um, bullish now than I was in the at the end of October. What kind of supporting factors are you talking about? I'm talking about um, kind of uh, this acceptance of Bitcoin as a, um, a flight to safety asset um, with what we've seen when um, the coronavirus news is coming out with China that uh, Bitcoin, gold, oil are strong with the killing of General Soleimani, Bitcoin skyrocketed. Um, other events like the halving, of course, are coming up. So there's just a lot of strong support uh, for Bitcoin. There's also a ton of open interest on the futures market, over $4 billion on exchanges like BitMEX, OKX, Deribit, etc. So um, I think there's, I see all of those as supportive factors, also contributing to volatility, but overall bullish. Sam, do you also see this latest uh, global crisis as a positive factor for Bitcoin, which should be reinforcing the, the bullish position? I don't know. I mean, I've heard a lot of those cited as bearish cases too. The open interest I've heard cited both ways. Uh, it, you know, it's super inconsistent how Bitcoin's been reacting to coronavirus. Like there has not been a consistent positive or negative beta. I think it's pretty hard to look at what's happened and have a strong opinion on whether uh, you know, it's been good or bad for Bitcoin. And this is sort of representative of, of the unique space it holds to some extent where it, it's both sort of thought of as, you know, a hedge for traditional market issues, in which case, obviously, you know, bad news is good news for Bitcoin, but also uh, bad news is just bad news for everything. And it means people have less money to invest in things. And we've seen sort of those two things fighting. And in the end, sort of historically, Bitcoin's had about a zero beta from traditional market moves. Um, and recently, it hasn't been displaying a consistent beta from, from NCOV either. So I, I don't know. I, I'm sort of not myself sold on them. I'm not sure they're wrong. Like they, they absolutely might be right. But sort of I don't personally feel convinced that these are sort of netting out to be positive or negative uh, factors. OK, you have, you have more a nuanced view on this theory of Bitcoin seen as a safe haven asset in, time of, in times of crisis. Yeah, and to be clear, it's way more of a safe haven asset than most, you know, than basically any stock. Uh, all stocks go down together and Bitcoin doesn't. But uh, but we also haven't necessarily seen Bitcoin go massively up in those periods. I mean, it's, it's been, yeah, just sort of mixed. I'll disagree with that because, for example, I remember the evening of January 2nd when uh, Bitcoin went down from 7180 to something like 6800 
6850. And then as soon as General Soleimani was killed uh, and there was kind of seen as global unrest, the possibility of war, Bitcoin absolutely spiked up to you know 7,400 and beyond. And it's been on a tear since then. And I think you have to attribute attribute January's upswing to something. And then I would say, what could it be attributed to other than these these those several factors? Yeah, uh, more buyers and sellers. I mean, uh, like my honest instinct is that a lot of places just don't bought a lot of Bitcoins. And, you know, if that person sells out, then maybe we'll go back down. And if they've got more to buy, then maybe we'll keep going. Uh, we're seeing a lot of mar- things that seem market driven instead of news driven, um, you know, and uh, today's run up, like you can try and attribute it to the, the BitMEX Ripple future listing. That seems to have been the local cause. Sales don't really make any sense. Not clear why that should be good for Ripple particularly. Um, like you could have argued that it would be bad as well. Um, and, uh, it's not clear why it should be good for other coins that, that sort of makes maybe the least sense, but, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't mean to express a super strong opinion here. I, I don't feel confident. I guess a lot of what I'm trying to express is just my lack of confidence in which direction it's going to go. And, you know, you may be proven right. The head of uh, research at the uh, Fundstrat, Tom Lee, said that Bitcoin is primed towards, uh, 200% average gains in the next uh, six months after recovering the 200 day moving average in January. So he basically said that when, you, when you're back above your 200 day move, moving average, you're back in a bull market. Whenever Bitcoin breaks back into its 200 day, its average six months gain uh, is uh, 197%. What do you what do you think about this uh, forecast? Uh, do you agree? Do you th- do you disagree, Joe? Uh, well, if it's me first, what I'll do is just do a quick screen share of some technical analysis. And in general, I think I do disagree with Tom. I think he's too bullish in this case. Uh, we do see, I would say, um, this almost. So after October, we saw this death cross where we saw the. Um, the uh, 100, the 50 day moving average moving below the 150 day moving average, as you can see, uh, where is the, that cross? It's around here. Um, but then what we see here is this green line and this orange line almost crossing again in the opposite direction, the golden cross. So people are, the recent moving average is is moving up above the longer term moving average. It's a very bullish sign. He, Tom Lee, predicted 27K by the end of summer. That's uh, very optimistic, I would say. Uh, if we move past 10,000, we can certainly go up to, you know, 14, 15,000. But that would be my, the limit that I could see based on previous chart analysis. Yeah, Tom's view seems extremely bullish. What's your uh, take on this, Sam? Uh, I've got some Bitcoins if he wants to pay 15k for them. Um, but, but but seriously, yeah, it's insane. Like, it, it's some claiming that 27k is like the expected value of a Bitcoin in six months. Um, I mean, if you actually thought that you could make a f- fortune. But no one thinks that. Uh, I think saying that's like the upside case, that's if things go spectacular, would be more reasonable. And that there's like a 5% chance. I think that seems way too high to me. But I think you could justify it. Uh, and maybe I'm wrong. But, you know, you, you could make an argument for there being a 5% chance of it getting up to 27k. I would disagree, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, claiming that, that this is like the expected case is insane. Mm-hmm. So... You don't think that uh, the fact that Bitcoin recovered this 200 day moving average is a very bullish no. sign. We've got like six effective data points here, right? Like he's looking at like six rallies and there's a billion factors you can look at. And he chose to look at moving above the 200 day moving average. Um, that's that's out of like a stable of like 300 different technical analysis things he could have been looking at. Okay. And one of them is going to show a 200% increase because it's just like only have a few data points and Bitcoin moved a lot a few years ago. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think if you want to argue that on the margin, that makes him a little bit more bullish. I think that would be a reasonable claim. I might disagree, but it would be reasonable. Um, you know, if you were saying I expect a 10% increase in it, it's our, on average over the next six months, that would be sort of a reasonable claim. Um, but uh, 200%, that, that's, uh, you know, that, that's quite the bullish take. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, Joe, uh, you have anything to add about this? 
Uh, I completely agree. The thing about crypto and Bitcoin is that um, because of, you know, the I guess the, the herd mentality with it, really, we see these uh, they're bull runs until they aren't right. So we saw last year with the Facebook Libra news when Bitcoin ran up to 14,000 that the next several months were down and even October was down until that uh, that that news out of China. So um, which was the one up month in the last six months of 2019. So um, there is a bull run now. We saw incredible gains in January, and the million dollar question is, will those incredible gains continue? I'm, it seems like I'm a little more event-based than Sam uh, in, in my analysis. I think if there is continued uh, unrest, if uh, things with coronavirus get worse, if uh, there's other sorts of global unrest, prices of oil and gold going up, I see Bitcoin continuing to increase. And if not, it could have a slide back to 6,800 as we saw in November and December. So Tesla uh, is making headlines lately because its stocks have been skyrocketing since uh, last fall, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, apparently they even beat Bitcoin in January as uh, the best performing asset of the month. And uh, many are uh, making a, a parallelism between Tesla and Bitcoin back in 2017, when there was this uh, bull run, this very abrupt surge, which at the end uh, was uh, accompanied by uh, an abrupt uh, fall in the price of Bitcoin. And uh, so even, uh, even Mike Novogratz in an interview with Bloomberg defined uh, both Tesla and Bitcoin bubbles. What do you mean it's like Bitcoin? You know, bubbles, there's a Tesla bubble going on. Uh, there's no doubt about this as a bubble. Bubbles happen around things that normally change the world. Do you see this parallelism between the behavior of Tesla and the behavior of Bitcoin back in 2017? Uh, what do you think, Sam? Eh, I mean, you could try and draw that parallel. I think that, like, first of all, I, I just think there's, like, limited amount you can get from, like, that. Like, there's so many graphs you can look at that you could be comparing this to. And, uh... It, but I think if you wanted to play that that analogy out, I think what you'd say is like what happened to Bitcoin and why. And I think the why is a crucial thing. And it, like if you just say, well, Bitcoin crashed, so Tesla will crash. It just says everything crashes. That's not a helpful analysis. I mean, sure, things crash sometimes, but when, how much will they go up first? And, you know, that that's just saying like sell anything that went up and some things keep going up and others don't. I think maybe the more helpful way to look at it is something like, why did Bitcoin not sustain its gains? And I think one thing you could say is the speculation got ahead of the use case and technology and and products that, you know, there is incredible, uh, you know, incredible FOMO, incredible uh, upwards buying pressure on Bitcoin driving up to 20K. But it's not like Bitcoin was taking over the world then. It was just taking over the world's imagination. And, you know, at the end of it, Starbucks didn't announce they're accepting Bitcoin as payment. No minor country announced that they were throwing out their currency and replacing it with Bitcoin. And Goldman didn't decide that they were going to start offering Bitcoin investments to their customers. You know, the CME futures were kind of a flop when they first listed. And that's maybe one thing is the turning point of like there's this giant bull run going up into it. CME futures listed and no one cared. No one traded them. And then the world's like, oh, wait, maybe we got a little bit ahead of ourselves here. And so I think you want to kind of draw that analogy out. Maybe what you'd say is like, well, what's behind this Tesla? bull run like is this just like people being like man elon i want to be him maybe if i own his stock i'll be more like him in which case yeah i, I would sort of expect this to revert or is this being like man we we're wrong elon knows how to f run a company um he's going to take over his industry and in fact he is and if it's that case then it's just going to keep going up and so i think the real question i'd be asking is is tesla going to deliver you know sure there's a lot of excitement right now what this comes down to is you know when the cyber truck comes out is it going to be the truck of the year? Is it going to sell a million trucks? Um, you know, is the Tesla just going to keep getting more and more market share? Is Tesla going to beat out all of its electronic rivals and our country is going to be moving increasingly towards electric cars? Or do you think that in a few years, yeah, Tesla will be one of 15 companies offering electric cars, but everyone's going to have them. Ford's is going to be just as good as well, you know, as well Nissan's and like Tesla's just going to be sort of a second rate car manufacturer that only has one business line. And I, I think that's sort of going to determine whether this is the start of something even bigger or a FOMO driven ball run that's just going to revert when people get their sense. So what's your take? Is it FOMO or is it like a company that is uh, 
doing great because it's great management, it's great idea. What, what, you know, what, I, I'm, what do I'm you kind of bullshitting here. I, I'm not an expert on, on Tesla. If I had to make something up, I don't know, it doesn't seem crazy to me. Like, it seems like this is a high upside play, banking on Tesla doing better than just well, banking on it having a, a non-trivial chance of becoming the world's premier car manufacturer, you know, churning out 10% of all cars in the world, um, you know, 15, 20%, something like that. And that is the future of car manufacturing. And, you know, I think there's a chance of that. And I think a lot of this is a, an upside play driven by thinking that there's an unfairly chance that if I had to make something up, I'd say like, you know, the median case is that Tesla falls, that it gives up some of these gains, but that doesn't mean that's the mean case. And that there's, you know, some real chance that it massively outperforms what it's done so far. And I don't know, it doesn't seem crazy that you go up a lot on those hopes, given that it, I think it's overall uh, been obviously made some huge fuck ups last year, but been playing its cards kind of reasonably recently. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Joe? Uh, do you agree with Sam? Do you see the parallelism between Bitcoin and, uh, and Tesla? I do agree with Sam. Uh, I, and what I agree with heartily is that, you know, what we what's baked in right now to the Tesla and the Bitcoin price is this future promise of both of them becoming uh, even larger and more used than they are. Obviously, Tesla has many great lines of vehicles and many of them are sold out, but the absolute the volume is a lot smaller than larger car manufacturers. Um, but, you know, sitting in Silicon Valley with companies valuations that we see like with Uber and Tesla and other things, it's it's based on people's uh, imagination of what those companies could be, as Sam said. Um, the one thing I would say is that's an interesting parallel with Bitcoin and Tesla is that when we're in these true bull markets and days and the price spikes up, um, you will often also, if you wait some time, you'll see uh, some, you know, some drop in the value. So just like yesterday, we saw prices of Bitcoin at 9100 or so, and today it's back over 9500 I expect the same with Tesla or any stock that has a, you know, a, a boom time. You'll see some some recursion as well happening. So I guess uh, if I were to invest in Tesla, I would uh, wait for, for um, the herd mentality to go away a bit and then pick some up. In a recent streaming, uh, a famous YouTuber and a Bitcoin educator, Ivan Ontek, brought up a, a very interesting topic, which is uh, the, uh, the topic of volatility and the store of value. He basically said that these two concepts, which uh, usually tend to be mutually exclusive, so if you have an asset which is a good store of value, is not volatile, and if you have a, an asset which is volatile, is not, is not a good store of value. He basically contested this, uh, this paradigm, saying that uh, it's actually not true, that actually volatility is not mutually exclusive with good store of value. Always think that if something is not volatile, it has great store of value. It has great store of value and uh, it's basically perfect for having your wealth. And so this is wrong, as I mentioned in the beginning of the stream. And we have the best example, which is the dollar, which is the dollar that has lost all of its purchasing power, but yet it's quite stable, it's quite not volatile, yet it's a bad store of value. So you see not volatile and terrible store of value. So volatility and store of value really is not connected. So uh, do you agree with this analysis, uh, Sam? Uh, no. Um, and, and, and I think like, just to start off with, if you polled people in the world said, what's the best store of value in the world, the US dollar would win that poll by a landslide. Every, almost every financial institution, almost every person would say US dollar. You get some votes for, for gold and a few for Bitcoin. I don't know, I think it's kind of a stretch to say the US dollar is a terrible store of value. Now, maybe he's talking about, I don't know what he means when he's saying that it's lost lots of its perks. Like, is he just talking about inflation? Because, you know, to that extent, like, it's absolutely true that the one thing I will say is that, like, there's a risk return thing here going on, right? Like, if you want to risk absolutely none of your money, you're not going to get the highest returns. So dollars under a mattress are not a high yielding object. But treasury bonds yield more than that, as do bank accounts. And if you want to invest in things like stocks, that yields has, you know, on average yielded more, but obviously come with, uh, you know, a bunch of volatility. Um, so there is this risk reward thing, um, but that's not sort of what I would think of as store of value so much as, as like, as yeah, you know, you, you, you take on more risk, you should get paid for that and, and in general you should expect to. But 
Uh, but in general, I think that exactly because it's not volatile, because people think it's the least likely thing in the world to have a massive crash, uh, most people think the US dollar is the best store of value. And I think most people do think that Bitcoin's volatility is a significant knock against its store of value. Now, there's a separate thing, which is like speculative interest, which I think is pretty different from store of value. And Bitcoin has a lot of that, and that's related to its volatility. And so if this is people hoping to get rich off it, then absolutely. But I think when people say store of value, they don't mean odds at 100x's. I think most of the people are saying like, can I put my money here and not be too worried? Exactly. And that's not true of Bitcoin. The, Joe, what do you think about it? Are you also skeptical about this, uh, this theory of uh, Ivan on tech? I am skeptical. I don't consider I, the US dollar is clearly a much stronger store of value currently than Bitcoin because of a few things. One is Bitcoin's volatility that does actually negatively impact the store of value. So I do disagree with that analyst in, in this case. Uh, and then also, um, the, the we uh, right now, as we've discussed, what we're doing is investing in Bitcoin for its, uh, its promise. And so we don't yet have enough use cases cases to, um, at, you know, it's not accepted as many places as the US dollar, let's just say that. So um, we'll see what happens with Bitcoin. It's a it's an extremely exciting asset. Um, and there's a lot it could very much appreciate. But to me, that's, um, that's uh, in conflict with the with the store value, unlike the US dollar. So you, you don't see the loss of purchasing value that uh, the that the dollar uh, suffered, because of inflation um, as something that compromises uh, his, state, his status as a store of value. In terms of the store of value, the point I'm making is that for me, when I invest in something as a store of value, I want to know exactly about how much that will be worth in a year, five years, 10 years. I know that with the US dollar. Yes, I know that uh, the dollar is, uh, you know, deflating over time, essentially. But at least I can expect that. With Bitcoin, you don't know where that will be in a year, five years, or 10 years. So that, to me, by definition, makes it a bad store of value. Because for a store of value, I'm actually not looking for that value to go up, necessarily. I just want to know what the value is in a year, five years, or 10 years. What's the most common misconception uh, about blockchain technology or uh, your company in particular, which you find yourself uh, um, clarifying over and over again? Oh, well, um, I'll start with misconceptions about companies and then blockchain. So for us at Bitbull Capital, we run crypto hedge funds. Um, and I think people often assume that our returns might be uh, correlated with uh, crypto's returns. And people don't yet understand fully how to profit off of volatility. Um, but uh, so you know, we're, we've had consistently months when we're up when crypto is down. And so I think that's just a misconception about hedge funds. People don't generally understand active management versus passive management in general. Um, that's one thing. Then in terms of blockchain, I guess, um, you know, it's funny, there, there was this rise of blockchain, I go to many conferences, and now um, with crypto and blockchain, there's kind of uh, some skepticism in the larger investor market, um, which is being overcome. Uh, but I think the, um, you know, I was listening to Ben Horowitz of Andreessen Horowitz speak recently, and he mentioned just how, you know, in the beginning days of, let's say, the iPhone, people were even, uh, you know, not, they didn't know what could be built on the iPhone. And I think with blockchain, people um, don't, people are expecting too much too soon of it and uh, are maybe skeptical of it because they don't truly see the developer potential that it does. But uh, I see the talent in the area and the developer talent in the area, especially in Silicon Valley. And uh, so that's part of my confidence in it. Right. And uh, what about you, Sam? What's your, the, the most uh, common dis misconception that you find yourself debating with most of the time? So I, I think that like these have been get, getting better over time. I think slowly the you know rate of misconceptions has been going down. Um, one thing if anything still hasn't percolated enough is just how much of, of crypto is operational. Um, that, you know, you look at Wall Street and if you want to trade stocks, there's like these things you have to do. It's very well defined. It can be a huge pain, but then you do them and you can trade stocks and that's how it works. And you look at crypto and it's very different. Within three minutes, you can do your first crypto trade, but it takes years to build up infrastructure where you can kind of trade as effectively as possible. Between getting banks that'll work with you, understanding transfers, exchange accounts that work well, understanding the differences between different products, thinking about capital distribution between different exchanges. And, uh, and there's just like so many 
factors that go into this because it's not a well integrated, well oiled infrastructure like traditional finance. But on the flip side, it's really lower barrier to entry means that it's it's not sort of this binary like you have a crypto trading setup or you don't. It really is this like you get what you put into it and that sometimes you'll find the best trade in the world and you won't be able to do it because you don't have a bank that's willing to wire money to the right place or your withdrawal limits are too small somewhere or something like that. And you're like, but I figured out the trade. I did the hard part. No, the hard part is getting that bank account sometimes and getting those withdrawal limits and, and everything like that. And so I think a lot of being able to trade crypto well is is really getting, uh, you know, putting just a ton of effort into getting the best operational setup you can. Hmm. Okay, cool. So basically you're saying that the crypto space so far has uh, some dysfunctionalities, uh, especially for people that uh, know how to trade, for example, while people that are completely new in the trading sphere can access crypto space much easier than what they, they would do in the traditional finance uh, system. Yeah, it's way easier to get into, but it takes just an, a ton of work and creativity to get the best setup you can. What do you think, Joe? Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. The setup of uh, appropriate trading systems uh, takes uh, months and months, if not years and years. Um, so I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. Cool, because actually uh, that leads me to one question that uh, I, have, I have prepared, which is uh, um, a research by cryptocurrency exchange uh, Deribit. Deribit, I think it's, it's uh, pronounced. So basically the research claims that crypto exchanges are kind of evolving towards um, towards uh, the financial traditional financial models like for example banks they are transforming themselves into uh, crypto banks so offering services that usually bank provide like for example uh, tax services um, interest the possibility to earn interest rates so so interest uh, accounts and uh, they are just improving those uh, legacy finance services um, and that's those features that belong to the traditional finance uh, world are those that uh, seem to be capable to spark mass adoption in the crypto in the crypto sphere. That's why crypto, crypto exchanges, according to this uh, analysis, are moving in, into that direction. Do you agree with the, this forecast? Yeah. So I think that you know a lot of what what crypto the kind of infrastructure industry is trying to do right now is is combine the best parts of of crypto with traditional finance you know, combine together a lot of the infrastructure and power that exists in traditional finance. You know, he sort of mentioned, uh, you know, interest and and tax services. But I, I would add on ease of, of moving fiat around, uh, simplicity of settlement uh, and connectivity of various venues while keeping sort of the how quick it is uh, to use crypto venues. And so, you know, keeping how quickly you can create accounts how quickly even a novice can understand the various products and really dig into them and get to a point where you can have sort of the most sophisticated suite of services offered by Wall Street sort of at your fingertips in the same way that crypto exchanges are at your fingertips. Joe, what do you think about it? Yeah, um, I, I agree. And actually, uh, not only Deribit is thinking about that, but um, Coinbase recently had an event for funds where their CEO Brian Armstrong spoke, and he spoke about something similar. Where he, you know, as you know, um, they not only can you buy and sell, but there was also a time where they started listing Tezos, and it was just to actually hold your Tezos there and earn interest. So even Brian Armstrong's talked about the Coinbase itself's roadmap, and it was not only to be an exchange and to buy and sell, but then also to stake, and you know, is where you own interest, maybe eventually vote you know, with delegation, and possibly even earn for interest coins and lend in the future. So definitely um, these exchanges, not only Deribit, but Coinbase and others as well, are thinking of extending to a traditional suite of services. There are five entities in China which controls uh, almost 50% of the hash rate produced to maintain the Bitcoin uh, network. So if uh, one single miner can control more than 50% of the Bitcoin network, it, can, it could bring potentially big problems uh, to, to the Bitcoin network. Do you see the concentration of all that mining power in five entities in China as a threat to 
the Bitcoin network as a system, Sam? I think it potentially is. Um, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm not an expert in this. I think others just know more than I about how worried to be about this in particular. But in general, I think this is a significant like thing that crypto is going to have to work out over the years. And I, I think that you can find a lot of cases of people thinking they've solved this when they haven't. I think you look at decentralized prediction markets as sort of a microcosm of this, where you have some sort of voting based mechanism for what the truth is. And uh, but nothing ties that to the real truth you're trying to get at. And and that sort of creates this danger zone where uh, if incentives are misaligned, uh, you know, it could end up just claiming things that look nothing like what you think it should be. And uh, I think this is a really hard problem to sort of solve in a really fundamentally satisfying way. Mm. Do you see other systems uh, an alternative to, to proof of work as somehow potentially a better alternative than proof of work, like for example, proof of stake? I, I don't think it's obviously better. I mean, it, it has its own demons, right? Like, you know, that's, uh, what does proof of stake really mean? It's, that's often even more centralized. Like you look a lot of the proof of stake coins and like one party basically has half of it. Um, so that's sort of quasi centralized in some sense, that party can say what they want. Um, now, of course, it would be really bad for their company if they did this, so probably they won't. And I'm not claiming that this is necessarily an imminent problem and that things are, are going to go to shit. And, and I would sort of argue against anyone who puts a very high probability of that happening for very prominent coins over the next year. But uh, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't solve the fundamental problem here that, yeah, it's a little shaky. And, uh, and you know, even if, if you have like pretty decentralized proof of stake, like, I don't know, why are people going to tell the truth? Well, if someone just like bribes everyone to lie about you know what the right block is how do you stop that you know and, and you can come up with lots of things that seem like pretty reasonable answers none of them are going to be like oh yeah that fundamentally solves this problem um and and i don't know i don't i don't have any great ideas for how to like absolutely fundamentally solve these problems hmm. what about you uh joe do you see it as a as a problem well, absolutely i mean i think one thing we all saw ethereum classic with a uh with you know over a million dollars was stolen from that from that blockchain uh, in the um, in the fifty one percent attacks just you know what two weeks ago three weeks ago so it's certainly a problem that was in of course uh, Ethereum Classic but with Bitcoin w the the kind of the news that I'm hearing about it is that it actually would take a lot less. Um, uh, than we think to do a 51% attack. Uh, and so that is a concern. I, I, I think Sam and I seem like we're both a little bit contrarian on this, where we actually are concerned about 51% on attack in Bitcoin. Yeah. When I talk to most people, they seem not concerned about it. But that is a concern, and that could happen. Um, so yes, it's a concern. And do you see any solutions for this problem? Uh, People are working on new and innovative technologies all the time. I know, um, you know, in addition to proof of stake, we've been looking into files, coin, proof of space time as well. And so uh, I don't know of any actual solutions at the moment. Like Sam, I remain skeptical about even alternative solutions. Uh, but um, I also have enough confidence in technology that I know that it will be figured out. So that to me isn't a fundamental argument against cryptocurrency to me. Um, it's just simply something that we're in the primordial stages of still and will be solving. Thanks a lot, Joe and Sam. It was a very cool discussion. I hope you will be with us soon on our channel. And you guys, always remember to like, subscribe and hodl. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe and hodl.